your your book is titled um, "Learning Systems Thinking." So why does that matter? Why should we learn that? Uh, so one, it's titled Learning Systems Thinking because O'Reilly is better that na at naming books than I am. Uh, that wasn't the original title. Um, what I'm was the original title? Mind Shift. Okay. Which they were like, that's not, no one's going to know what that means. Um, yeah. But in part because, so it the book came out of um, both the pain and the bullshit. Like my editor said, you need to put it in the book, but then they wouldn't let me write bullshit. They put like <laughs> the growlics to get rid yeah. of it, right? But that um, like most of us, right? I had been part of digital transformations, a part of the incredible amount of change we've experienced in the last 20 years. And yet the 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 I call it hitting the iceberg, right? The the digital transformation, and then just the chaos that happens, and these patterns are so consistent that it's almost painful. And so I started to become really interested in why, the why why are we struggling so much with change? Which is why I love your shirt today. It's the perfect <laughs> perfect shirt. Um, why are we struggling so much with it? And so the book really came out of trying to both describe the challenges that were really holding us back, but instead of just complaining and complaining about them, which is the thing I was doing for a while, just yelling at the tidal wave of, of, of drama, um, I tried to, to talk about what works. So what helps us when building modern systems, changing the way that we think and approach and, and communicate and code, what actually helps us and what's holding us back. And mm -hmm. so that's, that's, where, that's where the idea for the book came. Um, and then um, O'Reilly actually asked me, someone had said, oh, Diane is working on a book. And they said, well, we'd like to see the proposal. Well, it's not, it's not, there's no code in the book that will not make everyone happy. Um, and they did, and they were terrific. They were so good to work with. Yeah. Um, nice, and, nice folks at O'Reilly. Yeah. Yeah, I really, um, and I got the people, the people that specifically were um, part of the team that worked with me, I just, it was a great fit all, all the way along. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 so if I can quote you back to you, one of the things that I can't remember whether you said this in the book or in one of the videos that I watched online, but um, so you said, you said something, instead of building software, we're building systems. And that resonated quite strongly with me because because it seems often to me that the mistakes that we often make are kind of in the gaps between the pieces. And, and so, so, so could you explain a little bit by what you mean by that? So in sure. Yeah. So, and it's both. Um, it's so from from the system science point of view, uh, the one of the most important things about systems and systems design is that relationships produce effect. Mm -hmm. So most of the time when you're having these reoccurring challenges, it's in the relationships between the parts. I say it's a great day when the bug is in the code because usually it's an eventual consistency, right? Yeah. So from the system science point of view, what you're saying, what we're experiencing we have, you know, decades of, of support for that. From an experiential point of view, I started, like most of us who've been around for a while, building monolithic software. Yeah. And then we were decoupling, and then we were doing event-driven, and then we were doing... And the challenges we had when we were building a single piece of software um, 
the approach to that they don't it doesn't scale when you're building relationships between the parts yeah um and so that that's how those two things came together my own experience of how what was working and what wasn't working um for us as we were building software and then the fact that it's not in systems it's the relationships between the parts that's really where that's where we look to um both improve and to um change systems so um so yeah so that was my experience too so so i so i think that one of the ideas that you or two ideas that you tend to counterpoint are reductionism and systems thinking and while valuing them both i think i, I just wouldn't wondered if you could explain what you meant by that just to make sure that you know we're all understanding what it is that you're describing yeah and it's very um it's it, it's such a challenge it's been a challenge for me to find the language because um what i mean by what i call linear thinking um linear thinking reductionism it's so familiar to us and it's so what we've been taught that we think of it as thinking mm -hmm. like that's thinking so sometimes it's sort of explaining water when we're fish like it's hard to um, understand that our way our approach to software in over or maybe not over emphasizes but definitely strongly emphasizes a particular type of thinking but it is only one type of thinking and that is that when faced with complexity that we break it down into parts in order to be able to understand it. Object-oriented programming. My first um, professor used a car as his analogy to help us understand object-oriented programming. So you have a class that encapsulates the braking system and you encapsulate the, um, the steering column and then the software becomes a um, parts orchestrating together to make a car. Yeah. When we learn, we learn in a linear way, meaning you develop foundational skills and say Golang, and then you do harder and harder things that are more complex. The challenge is though that once we've break bro once we've broken things down into parts, we then think we can understand the system by understanding the parts and it doesn't work the other way that we can we can um, set bound create boundaries in a system we can understand particular patterns and ignore other patterns we can frame the way we're looking at it but we don't actually understand how relationships produce effect Right, because like you and I said, most of what most of the juicy bits, most of what we really need to know is happening in between them. Yeah. And so systems in systems, it's about when you have two parts. So let's say two pieces of software that communicate, say, via an API they, or they share information. Same with two teams. What we're really looking at is when those two parts are working together, you get a third thing, which is what you get that neither of them could do alone. Yeah. So that's called emergence, right? Yeah. And that when you're designing, increasingly what we're designing in software, especially information systems, is for emergence for how do these relationships get us something that we couldn't get from a monolith or we couldn't get from one team. Yeah. And that's where systems thinking comes in because reductionism or linear thinking helps us to sort of try and gain control over, over one piece of it, but it doesn't help us solve systemic challenges. This clip was taken from my podcast, The Engineering Room with Dave Farley a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering.
You can find full episodes on all your favourite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.